By 1820, Britain had, in effect, turned the Persian Gulf into a British lake and focused its attention on Afghanistan, on Persia's eastern border to protect its colonial interests in India against Russian encroachments, secure lines of trade between India and Britain via the Middle East, and to expand commercial markets in the region. The vast territory of Central Asia, stretching some 2,000 miles between British India and the outlying regions of Tsarist Russia, was still unmapped. And the exotic cities of Merv, Bukhara, Kiva, Samarkand, and Tashkent were virtually unknown to outsiders. As Russian expansion threatened British dominance of the Indian subcontinent, the two great empires played out a subtle game of diplomacy, exploration, and espionage in the region. Caught in the middle, Persia was destined to remain a buffer state whose precarious sovereignty and course of foreign policy would be influenced profoundly by the dictates of the neighboring powers. As the Tsar's troops began to subdue one Khanate after another, the British feared that Afghanistan would become a staging area for a Russian invasion of India. With this in mind, the British launched the First Anglo-Afghan War in 1838 and tried to impose a puppet regime. The regime was short-lived and unsustainable without British military support. By 1842, mobs were attacking the British on the streets of Kabul, and the British garrison of some 4,500 military and about 12,000 civilians, including women and children, was forced to retreat from Kabul back to India. During the retreat, they came under a series of ruthless attacks by tribesmen, and all but a few dozen were killed. Following this humiliating retreat, the British put their ambitions in Afghanistan on hold for about 35 years. Russia's expansive ambitions in the Caucasus precipitated the Russo-Persian Wars of 1804 to 1813, and again from 1826 to 1828, resulting in Russia's absorption of Persian territories in that region. The Treaty of Gulistan, after the First War, recognized Russia's annexation of Georgia and most of northern Caucasus, and the Treaty of Turkmanchai of 1828 acknowledged Russian sovereignty over the entire area north of the Aras River, including present-day Armenia and Azerbaijan. Russia thus began to exert an influence in Persian affairs, previously enjoyed only by Britain. In the same period, the Russo-Turkish Wars of 1806 to 1812, and again from 1828 to 1829, increased Russian influence in Ottoman affairs at the expense of Britain. Russia and Britain had a common interest in maintaining the region as a buffer zone, which brought them into cooperation and collusion in settling Ottoman-Persian disputes, even while they competed and conspired against each other. Hence, both supported the ascension of Mohammed Mirza to the throne of Persia in 1834 to forestall the disorganization of the empire in fractious rivalry for the throne. Furthermore, in the same year, they established an understanding to maintain the integrity and independence of Persia. In effect, Britain and Russia had control of Persian affairs and were cooperating to share power between them. The two powers competed in a race for vast concessions to exploit Persia's natural resources. Each undertook to build communications and transportation infrastructures that would facilitate their exploitation. At the time the Bab declared his mission in Shiraz in 1844, Muhammad Shah Qajar ruled Persia. His short rule from 1834 to 1848 lacked the assertiveness of either his predecessor and grandfather, Fat Ali Shah, or his successor, Naziruddin Shah, both of whom enjoyed long reigns and paid consistent attention to glorifying the monarchy. Muhammad Shah was a weak monarch and is often said to have deferred to the mystic tendencies of his unpopular Grand Vizier, Haji Mirza Akasi. The administration of Haji Mirza Akasi, the Prime Minister or Grand Vizier of Persia, 
between 1835 and 1848, showed signs of serious deterioration due to mismanagement, factional rivalry, court intrigues, and nepotism. To cope with declining state revenue, caused partly by the transfer of crown lands to private owners and partly by the inability to collect taxes regularly, the government resorted to the practice of auctioning provincial posts. Except in provinces that remained the monopoly of powerful semi-autonomous governors like Isfahan and Khurasan, governors often served no longer than one or two years, which seriously affected the performance of their provincial administration, itself divided by factional disputes. Profligacy and greed, the inevitable outcome of such policy, could only encourage corruption and oppression at all levels. Wronged by the governor's indiscriminate extortions and terrorized by the undisciplined and badly paid troops, who were themselves often in revolt against the provincial governors, the public frequently turned for protection to the city notables and religious dignitaries who, more often than not, exploited popular discontent for their own purposes. The reign of Muhammad Shah was particularly marred by urban violence and frequent eruption of popular discontent. The government's failure to maintain law and order, as well as the shortcomings of administration and finance under Premier Akasi, brought them to the verge of collapse. For most of the time after 1828, the military threat from foreign powers was accompanied by diplomatic pressure, political blackmail, and humiliation. The Qajar monarchs could not fail to realize that their survival depended as much on their ability to preserve internal equilibrium as on their capacity to accommodate the conflicting interests of their neighbors. When Muhammad Shah died, in 1848. His country was on the verge of civil war, financial bankruptcy, and a religious revolution. Heir to the Qajar throne, Prince Naziridin was serving as provincial governor in Tabriz, the capital of the Persian province of Azerbaijan, when his father, Muhammad Shah, died. Seven months' residence in Tabriz provided Naziridin, then only 17 years of age, with his first experience at governing. Premier Akasi, unwilling to assign too much power to the crown prince, had identified a trusted candidate to take command of the provincial army. But Nazir Din was not willing to surrender entirely to the premier's wishes. He too was searching for a candidate. Mirza Taki Khan was then promoted to acting chief of the Azerbaijani army. It is not clear to what extent this appointment enjoyed the backing of the crown prince, but given the fact that Mirza Taki Khan was supported by the British, he emerged as the most suitable candidate. The British minister in Tehran, who saw Mirza Taki Khan as a competent bulwark against Russian influence, must have been able to convince Premier Akasi and Naziri Din to promote the civilian army secretary to the highest military rank. Events during the summer of 1848 proved the effectiveness of the newly appointed Vazir Nizam. Serious anti-Armenian riots occurred in June, involving both the Russian and British consuls and the ulama of Tabriz. Mirza Taki Khan demonstrated his effectiveness in quelling the disturbances, but the incident also showed Nazirin his vulnerability in the face of foreign intrigue and popular discontent. This episode was soon followed by another highly sensitive and potentially dangerous affair, the public trial of the messianic claimant, Sayyid Ali Muhammad Shirazi, the Bab, in early July. Shortly after the riots subsided, the episode of the Bab's trial added to the unrest. 
growing enthusiasm in favor of the persecuted prophet was a source of anxiety to the government, as well as to the ulama. Never since his messianic proclamation in 1844 had the Shirazi Sayyid and his followers received as much public attention as they did in Tabriz. The Bab had been in solitary confinement in the castle of Shariq, in the vicinity of Salmas, in southwestern Azerbaijan, on the Ottoman frontier, and was brought to Tabriz by Premier Akasi's order to stand an inquisitory trial by the ulama. The chief purpose of the trial was to demonstrate to the public the so-called heretical nature of his claims. Naziri Din himself presided over the tribunal, which included, among other ulama, Naziri Din's tutor and the chief shaky leader of the city, as well as government officials and aides to the crown prince. Fear of the consequences of collaborating in any condemnation of the Bab kept many ulama away, and other mujahids were excluded by the government for fear that their call for the execution of the Bab might create unnecessary trouble. The Bula Bashi, who led the interrogation on behalf of the ulama, began by asking the Bab a series of questions on the exact nature of his claim and the authenticity of the writings circulated in his name. The Bab's unequivocal affirmation of the divine origin of his mission and the authenticity of his writings put the Mullah Bashi on the defensive. The Bab, in response to the ulama's charges of blasphemy and fraud, for the first time publicly claimed that he was indeed the expected Imam of the age, the Mahdi, or Chaim, whose return had been anticipated for a thousand years. This dramatic and unequivocal announcement, I am, I am, I am the promised one, drew the strongest condemnations from the furious Mujtahids. Their vituperative reproaches and sarcasm prompted the Bab to question their motives and then to remain silent for the rest of the trial. The Tabriz proclamation was a unique historical occasion because it not only made public the independence of the Babi religion from Islam, but more tangibly symbolized the start of a messianic movement that was soon to ignite passions across Iran. The Mujtahids of the Tabriz gathering were embarrassingly naive in their questioning of the Bab but they were canny enough to avert a situation in which Naziridin would become captivated by the young claimant, an outcome that would improve the chances of any future Babi reconciliation with the state. The young and inexperienced Naziridin was cleverly persuaded by his advisors to send his personal physicians including Dr. William Cormack, to examine the Bob in order to determine his sanity. Their predictable verdict of insanity, as Dr. Cormack himself acknowledged, was an expedient designed to save the Bob from execution. Dr. Cormack wrote some years later that his report to the Shah at the time of the trial was of a nature to spare the Bob's life. After his mock trial and public punishment inflicted by Bastinado at the hands of the chief religious judge of Tabriz, the Bob was sent back to prison in Shirik to await his fateful end. In the early months of his return to Shirik, he was still confident of the triumph of his religion, which, as he saw it, could only be achieved by sacrifice and martyrdom. In late 1849, in one of his last surviving letters, the Bab urged the ulama of Tabriz to remove the veil of bigotry and ignorance and recognize the reality of his mission.
During the Bab's imprisonment, a group of his followers met in Khurasan, in the hamlet of Badasht, east of Bastam. This was the first time that a prominent group of Babis, some 81 participants in all, mostly from Khurasan, Mazindaran, and Kazvin, gathered to review and debate a range of questions essential to the identity and future direction of the movement. The rising tides of persecution, highlighted by the Bab's captivity, and the growing isolation imposed on the Babis by their opponents, gave rise to a new spirit of defiance. The Bab's call on his followers to gather in Khurasan was an implicit acknowledgement of this spirit. One of the items on the unwritten agenda concerned the rescue of their spiritual leader, now incarcerated in a remote castle in Azerbaijan. Another important issue was the very nature of the movement itself, its ultimate purpose, and its future course of action. It's not surprising that strong differences of opinion existed within an embryonic body of converts whose loyalty to the founder of the movement was not yet translated into a consensus on the identity of his proposed creed. Some saw it as simply a reform movement within Islam. Others believed it was an independent religion requiring a complete and dramatic break with Islam, with its order, its ecclesiasticism, its traditions and ceremonials, while a militant minority viewed it as a revolutionary political movement which could be used to bring about the downfall of the oppressive Qajar regime and the sacerdotal order which supported it. Just as those who, during the advent of Christ, were awaiting a temporal messiah who would free them from militarily from the yoke of the Romans, there were those in the time of the Bab who awaited the Mahdi, a messianic savior who they believed would destroy disbelief and oppression by force. One of the most respected leaders of the Babi movement at that time, a young man from Tehran named Mirza Hussein Ali Nuri, later known as Baha'u'llah, unobtrusively yet effectively was able to bring about an uneasy understanding between the conflicting factions. The approach he espoused was that of a clear break with the past, but strongly advocating non-violent moderation in its implementation through reasoned persuasion by the word, not the sword. Ever since the death of Muhammad Shah, the situation in the capital had undergone dramatic changes. Akasi was aware of the resentment of the Qajar ruling elite, who refused to carry out Akasi's orders or recognize his authority. Because of his anti-aristocratic policies, Akasi stood little chance of political survival once he lost his royal patron. The new council, the Majlis, that convened soon after the Shah's death, was the embodiment of the same threatened nobles and had the support of Malik Jahan Khanum, wife of Muhammad Shah Qajar and mother of Naziridin Shah. She became known as Macht Ulya upon her son's accession to the throne in 1848. Macht Ulya was entrusted with the affairs of state at the end of her husband's life until the crown prince could reach the palace in Tehran from Tabriz, the traditional seat of the heir to the throne. She continued to be involved in politics after her son became Shah. On the night of the Shah's death, two powerful representatives of the council contacted the British Chargé d'Affaires, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Ferrant, pledging their full allegiance to Nazaruddin Shah. 
They emphasize their unanimous readiness to oppose Akasi, having already convinced Mahdulia to issue a proclamation confirming Akasi's dismissal. The council persuaded Farant, jointly with Prince Dolgorukov, the Russian minister plenipotentiary, to send a note to Akasi, recommending that he stay in his summer residence and refrain from governmental activities until the Shah's arrival. Akasi decided to make a final bid for survival, which failed. To escape arrest, he fled to his estate, Yaftabad, but even there met with resistance from the local villagers. Haji Mirza Akasi, the chief instigator of the outrages perpetrated against the Bab, was hurled from power and deprived of his ill-gotten riches. He wandered over the plain south of Tehran in search of protection before eventually taking refuge in the sanctuary of Abdulazim. He was later ignominiously expelled to Karbala, falling prey to disease, poverty, and gnawing sorrow, a piteous vindication of that denunciatory tablet in which the Bab had foreshadowed his doom and denounced his infamy. The arrival of Mirza Aka Khan Nuri, secretary of the old army, from his Kashan exile, to which he was banished following his unsuccessful bid to oppose Akasi in 1846, added a new challenge to the council and almost immediately became a formidable factor in the ongoing power struggle in the capital. He was closely associated with Mahdulia and for years was on friendly terms with the British mission and personally known to Farant. Nuri relied on both sources to further his influence. Ferrand clearly saw Nuri's worth as a British sympathizer and a viable candidate for premier with considerable influence in the army, and he had no hesitation recommending him to Mahdulia. The kind and affable manner by which this great favorite of Mahdulia was received in Tehran convinced Ferrand that Nuri's return to power with British support would help the young Shah acquire popular backing. Serious opposition to Nuri came from an unexpected quarter. Objecting to his unauthorized return to the capital, the newly appointed Amir Nizam, Mirza Taki Khan, in his first real show of force, advised the Shah to order Nuri's return to Kashan. It was clear that Farant did not wish to allow Amir Nizam to carry the day. Upon further insistence from the Shah's camp, he opted for a familiar ploy long used by his predecessors. To nullify the royal decree, he extended diplomatic protection to Nuri and his relatives. Having sought British protection, Nuri was obliged to shelve his plans temporarily, but he did not leave the political arena altogether. Counting on Naziridin's best intentions, Farant hoped the Shah's arrival would put an end to the power struggle, yet he foresaw problems in forming a viable government. There were numerous aspirants for the premiership, but few with talent and experience. Farant concluded that Amir Nizam would also be ruled out, leaving the stage free for the council's candidate. As it turned out, he was too hasty in his assumption. By his own account, Amir Nizam was able to demonstrate his unrivaled value to the Shah as an instrument of consolidation. While still waiting outside the capital for the auspicious hour, he had managed to remove potential hurdles in the way not only of his royal master's accession, but also of his own premiership. The new army that he brought from Azerbaijan proved to be a weapon more vital to his own assumption of power than to Naziridin's so far unchallenged accession to the crown. It is not surprising, therefore, that on the occasion of his coronation, or soon after, the Shah conferred upon his prime minister, Mirza Taki Khan, the title of Amir Kabir, a title by which he came to be known to posterity. This was an unprecedented honor for a non Qajar, and entitled him to be not only the commander in chief of the new army of Azerbaijan, 
but also the supreme commander of the entire Persian army. Naziruddin's coronation took place with all the pomp and ceremony symbolic of the Shah's official assumption of power. Entering the capital on October 20th, 1848, at the most auspicious hour, as determined by the royal astrologer, he was received by the princes of the royal family, the notables, the chiefs of departments, and nearly the whole population of Tehran. On the same night, Amir Kabir, wearing a pearl-ornamented robe of honor, was appointed to the office of premier, and was the Shah's decree, issued a few days later, declared, I have delivered all affairs of Persia into your hands, and hold you responsible for the good or bad that may ensue. We have this day made you the first person in Persia. We have every trust and confidence in your justice and treatment of our people. Never before in Qajar history had so much power rested with one official.